C-Dub on the beat Back against the wall, CL20's knocking ready IGI's tripping, validated, shoot ready Brown incarceration, got my people living daily Gang wars back to back to the home is where they send me Hey yo, what's good with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day, feeling blessed, and like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We got we only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. With that being said, one of my subscribers said um, he wanted to hear another war story. I got a pretty cool one. I got an interesting one. I got one that turned out, you know, unexpectedly. And uh, this was one of my proudest moments, even though I was living a bad life back then and I was doing a lot of negativity. This is one of the positive things I've done in my life, so I would like to tell you about it. Hit that subscribe button, hit that like, always leave a comment, let me know what you guys think in the comment section, and hit the links in the description. I was living in Porterville in 2005, right? And I had a homie with me, the homie Sparks. You know, he was always at my pad. He was always chilling. I used to let him sleep on my pad a lot. You know, I was real close to his daughter. He was real close to my mom. My brother lived in the apartment at the time. But I was mostly on the streets. I only came and went as I pleased. You know, I was always a, an addict and running amok. I was going back crazy out there. So um, one day I'm just like, I wanted to sober up a little bit. So I, I went to the pad. Me and Sparks are chilling. We didn't want to go to the streets. We just wanted to hang out. We wanted to get our grub on and catch up on all the food we haven't been eating on. And um, when, I used to hit my, when I used to hit my licks, right, I used to hit my jack moves, like I always had this weird, like, um, should I say, it was a habit. It was like a customary thing that I would do. I'd, I'd come up on a stack of bread. And then I would just, I'd always go to Music Train in Porterville and I'd always buy like two DVDs and two CDs. And that was like my gift to myself. I was buying a lot of the T-Nutties, a lot of the Looney Colleones, a lot of the Brother Lynch. I was buying a lot of Sacramento music at the time. And of course, if the Northern Exposure came out, you know, I had to get the Northern Exposure. But I remember getting DVDs a lot like Hood to Hood, Street Brawls and Ghetto Brawls. And uh, I got Fresno Uncensored. I used to watch Fresno Uncensored like crazy. And so I'd always buy like these, 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 you know, these street videos and just sit there and just blow all day. I'd be blowing loud all day just, watch, just watching people just, you know, duke them out on the streets. So that's what happened. I'm, I bought a DVD and I'm chilling. I'm watching. I'm watching full squab. You know, I'm watching girls get provocative, you know, do all kinds of weird stuff, you know, make it bounce. Ba, 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 ba. And we just blowing the wood. You know, we burning down the wood. And me and a homie are chilling on the couch. I don't know where my brother was at at the time. And, um, bam, my, 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 my mom's upstairs and I'm chilling and I'm not tripping on nothing. Remember, I'm already zoned out. I'm 18 years old, blown. I'm like, I'm pretty much half dead. And I hear my mom scream like loud out of her window. Like, let her go. Leave her alone. And now when you lit and you hear that kind of thing, like I froze a little bit. I was kind of like, what? Looked at my Cody. My Cody looked at me. We all looked at each other. We're looking back at the stairs. Like, what the hell was that? And I hear foots running, footsteps running down the stairs. And my mom bends the corner, looks, sees both of us. Bro, it was like an episode off training day when, when, when they were robbing old girl's spot for that money. And they gave her that fake warrant. And then she looked at her homie. She goes, hey, fool, what the hell y'all just standing there for when we blast these fools? That's what my mom did. She looked at me like, what? She was wondering why we were just sitting there. Doing nothing. And she goes, man, they just tried to kidnap a little girl outside. Me and, my, me and my Cody were like, what, what, what? Sobered right up real quick. My whole high went out the door. I jump up. He jumps up. And uh, I hear a little girl crying. That's all I hear. I don't see the little girl. And I see two kids, bro. They were like maybe 16, 17. They were skateboarders. They had the long hair all not brushed. And, you know what I mean? They look like a bunch of Justin Beavers. He was younger. And uh, she's all, them right there. They tried to kidnap a little girl right now. And I was like, okay. So I, I just went off my mom. You know, my mom led me to do this. So we hopped the fence. We chased him down. I'm trying to chase one of them. But that, that boy, like, he threw his skateboard down. And he just booked it. And he had wheels. And I couldn't catch him. I could not catch him for the life of me. And then I, I so he runs through the dirt. And I stop. And I look back. And my Cody's standing next to the other one. The other fool's holding his skateboard. And he's, like, in shock. And I was like, hey, fool, hit that fool. And my Cody starts, bah, da, 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 bing, 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 bow, bow, bow. Then I catch up, bang, 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 bam. We grab the skateboard, bam, bam, bam. Now we just molly whopping this boy bad. And his, 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 his homie, his brother, whatever it is, didn't jump in. But he's screaming, like, leave him alone, leave him alone. Help, help, help. 
But I'm like, man, I ain't finna go chase this dude again, man. He already, he already took half my win. I'm cool, man. You, you can just stand there and watch, bro. You can have, you know, you, you got the front row seats to this. I repeat him up. He gets close towards us, and he stops a black truck. And dude, like the biggest, notorious bicep I've ever seen. He came out with the, the hat, the shirt tucked in, the belt buckle, the jeans with the boots. He had like five rings on each finger. And he's like begging the dude, help, help, they're hurting him, they're hurting him. He made himself look like the victim. Now, there's parts of like, the, the homie's still doing his Dougie. And I go over there to try to get on this fool. And the bicep just hits me one time in my forehead. Bing! And I said, poof. Stop me in my tracks, bro. I was like, I ain't finna brawl with this Dude, I'm 18. That dude look like he's 35. And he just like, like he breaks down the trees in the fields, man. And he just rips them off the ground and throws them. That's how big this bicep was, bro. He was notoriously big. And my mom runs and she starts yelling at him in Spanish like, nah, they were good there. Nah, that's not my son's fault. It's the kid's fault. Woo -do -woo -do -woo -do -woo -do -woo. And so the bicep, the kid runs and the other kid runs. And then I, I, I go back. I'm like, man, I, I, I got a little ring design in my forehead i don't know if it was an eagle or whatever it was but it's like light red i'm like i'm mad now i'm like bro i just got dome checked by a bicep hell no nah, bro and i go back to the house and then i start talking to my mom right i, I like whatever i had left and i'm asking my mom like what happened she said that what she seen from the window that she was staring out the window because she was smoking a cigarette and uh she seen these two kids and all they did was just, there was a little girl riding a bicycle who lived in my apartment complex that all they did was run up to her and grab her and go, Rawr! and then let her go. But she fell off her bike and landed on the ground and she screamed. So I'm like, okay, that's messed up. I was like, but you accused them of kidnapping, bro. Like, like that's why I reacted. Now, I'm pretty sure I would have reacted the same way, telling me that part of the version too. I, would, you know, I don't mind scraping anybody for stupid reasons. I've fought people for dumber stuff. But you accused them of kidnapping. That was like a whole nother level. That, that, uh, that What if I would have did something uh, like extreme? You know? What, what if I would have did that? You know what I mean? But anyways, so my code D was on the run, right? So I tell him, hey, man, go to the homie's next door's pad, bro. I'm pretty sure the cops are going to come. Cops come. My mom's like, get up out of here, man. The cops are here. So I bounce. <laughs> The cops talk to my mom. My mom explains everything. They're, they want to they wanna question us. And my mom's like, they're not here. They left. I'm thinking with my co-defendant, like, damn, man, we're probably, we're, probably, they're gonna, we're, we're gang members. We're identified. We're probably going to go to jail for this, bro. This, this is going to suck, man. We try to be heroes, and I'm pretty sure the justice system is going to put handcuffs on us for beating up some 16-year-olds. I was already 18, so that's like assault on a minor. My, my code, he was 15, so, you know, he's just going to get for a simple fist fight. But me, assaulting a minor, bro, that's that's going to be hard to really go through if I have to go report to the homies and tell them, like, look, bro, I beat up this 15-year-old, bro, but he had it coming, homie. He was riding a skateboard in my hood, and I didn't like it, bro. I didn't like the color of his shoes. Bro, it's going to be, that was going to be a hard investigation to prove otherwise. But we didn't go to jail. And I'm like, cool, man. I, I was thankful. I went back home, like, later on that night. My mom was, she wasn't tripping, like she had my back because she knew oh, this wasn't my fault. And what was awesome is that uh, at the time when the cops were called, my mom actually went and called, grabbed the little girl that was crying, walked her home, and told the parents. And the parents came out all crazy, and I heard the dad was all crazy, like, hey, man, I want to catch these fools. I'm going to hurt them. And in my head, I'm like, bro, he's underage, bro. You're going to go to jail just as much as I'm going to go to jail. You don't want to go to jail for that. I wind up meeting the parents later on, uh, like maybe three or four days later. Then my mom told me that they wanted to meet me. And so I meet them, and the dad like shook my hand and gave me a hug. He's like, man, thank you for protecting my daughter, such and such and such. I appreciate it, man. If I ever see them fools, man, I'm going to hurt them. Woo, woo, woo. And I was like, it's all good, bro. It's cool. So they invited me to dinner. And I was like, all right, I got to go to dinner with them. And then like, it's something dawned on me. Like when I met the oldest daughter, she was over 18. She used to always drive this white Impala, like this 95, 97 white Impala. I was like, okay, you know, thanks for the dinner. You know, I got to bond with him, chop it up with him. He asked me if I ever needed anything, let him know. You know, he yells me that. I was like, cool. And the whole time, I'm just staring at his daughter cooking with his mom, like, with her mom, like, damn, man, I might just need your daughter for like three or four days, you know what I mean? And that Impala too, you know, she can let me borrow the keys to that. I fill it up with half a tank after I'm done with it. 
Well, I wound up hooking up with the daughter like later on, but it was like only twice. Once in the apartment complex in the parking lot and once at a hotel. That was pretty much it. She did her own thing. She just thought we were, we were just cool. We were on a bonding moment. That same week, right? I'm with my, uh, this is when I was with my ex-wife at the time. She was at my pad chilling. She knew my co-defendant Sparks. Big chilling, right? And um, she's going on, she's going home. It's like maybe 10, 12 at midnight. 10, 12 at midnight, something like that. And uh she goes home. So me and Sparks go outside. We're gonna light a blunt. We're gonna go to sleep. But we just it's, we're gonna call it a night. We have we've been having a rough week. We've been coming down. We've just been smoking hella, hella dank, sleeping, eating, watching TV. We were just lazy. Our bodies were going through. Sure enough, my ex-wife comes back. And she's panicking, she's crying, she's going hysterical, and I'm like, what's going on? She goes, man, somebody tried to carjack me right now, two dudes walking in the street, tried to carjack me right now, and I'm like, all right. For a minute then, I was like, man, you just wanted a reason to come back and spend time with you because you wanted to see I was here, you wanted to see if I left. You know, I was on some weird paranormal stuff, paranormal stuff like that, like, what, brother? I think you're lying. So me and uh, Sparks jumped in the, uh, in the car, it was a... Uh, it was, uh, it was manual, so you know it was stick shift. So you know I didn't know how to drive that. So Sparks did. So we're driving, hit a couple of corners, and then we see just see two dudes with hoodies on walking around. One of them had a crowbar, and my my Cody's like, "Is this them?" I'm like, "I don't know, maybe." He's like, "What do you want me to do?" I was like, "All right, we're already here. I don't see two other people walking the street. Hit them." And my Cody hits them, bam, with the car. Now they start running. My boy didn't hit him that hard because they still on their feet and running, but it messed up the front of the car. So now we were like, we're chasing them. We parked the car like on Olive Street around that time. And we get out and then we, we, we catch up to him. We run up to him and we catch up to him. We're squaring off. And now we're boxing two on two in the middle of Olive Street, right across the street from Taco Bell. Boxing, boxing. But we forgot that that fool had a crowbar in his hand. And sure enough, I'm boxing this for and I look at my Cody real quick, and my Cody's like boxing, and then he just gets hit with a crowbar. Boom! And I see my Cody go. Poof. And they're still boxing, and then they, they just start running again. So we try to chase them, and they go into Taco Bell, and they start screaming, they're trying to hurt us. They're trying to, I mean, these dudes were grown men. They were like in their mid-30s, early 40s, out there carjacking people. And they just said, these kids are trying to hurt us. Ah. They started crying. So me and my Cody were like, oh, it's time to go. Cops are coming. We jumped in the car. And drove back to the house, and then my Cody had a little red mark on his forehead, and he was like, bro, that fool hit me with a crowbar, bro. He really hit me with a crowbar, bro. And he just seen that red bar right there, and I was like, man, I felt so bad, bro, because I didn't get hit. You know, I mean, I squabbed with the other dude, but the other dude, like, he, he kept putting his head down, so I was just pretty much hitting his head with the hoodie on. I didn't get much good hits on him. But it was like one bad week. That was a bad week for me and my Cody's. Like every time we just wanted to kick back, relax, something was getting thrown at us. We had to go do this. We had to go do that. We come back home. Like, oh, crew, let's rest. Get another phone call. Go. We got to go put in work. We got to go jump this dude. We got to go jump that dude. What a hectic week, bro. What a very hectic week. And I'm always going to love my Cody, man, because I was one of my Cody's to this day. And he's one of my subscribers. You'll hear him on my live. You'll see him commenting a lot of my comments and my videos. Me and that boy been through more stuff than anybody could possibly imagine. He he hit most of my uh my my two elevens with me, the ones I got convicted of. He was there. Me and that boy can if me and that dude was to do a podcast together and tell you guys all the war stories that me and him ever been through, that'd be a podcast in itself, man. But my subscriber wanted me to tell you a couple war stories. I thought of these ones. I said, you know what? I'm going to tell these ones instead of the other ones because the other ones can wait for another time. So with that being said, like I always say, it's one live, one chance. When they got one chance to do this right, let's get it done. Peace.